you know, to be a compassionate winner is easy, but can you be a compassionate loser? They, they won, and we've never forgiven them. We will, you know, we'll never forgive them for winning. Uh, in America, uh, the wounds of, of the war are not healed. Uh, certainly when we look at what Washington is doing, uh, we're creating other Vietnams all over the world. So we may be uh, ha having the same discussion in Iraq 30 years from now when people say, well, when are we going to finally clean up the destruction that occurred in Iraq? I hope not, but we, uh, so far <laughs> our record is not very good. And the truth is, nobody wins a war. It's, you know, it's hard to say they won because nobody wins a war. You may stop a war, but everybody, everybody loses. For me to come back to Vietnam is all about reconciliation and about what I call meeting the enemy. And when I talk about meeting the enemy, there's two enemies. That's the enemy inside of me and the enemy I fought against. And I think the enemy I really met was the one inside of me. And that's the one I made peace and reconciliation with. And that's the one that was necessary. For our veterans, they were engaged in behavior, which is killing. That's what war is. Right? You're doing it either directly or indirectly. And we're taught not to kill in every religious teaching. So you're engaging as a very young person in a behavior that's directly opposite to the earliest things you're taught as a child. That conflict stays and it, and it gets very deep. And then as you get older and you have your own children, I, it, all of these things haunt. Uh, when U.S., in my experience, when U.S. veterans return here and when Vietnamese Americans and from other nationalities return here, a lot of that trauma drops off because the images they're carrying and the, the emotions stop wherever the trauma happens. So 1970, 1969, wherever the emotions stop and, and it gets crystallized. But when they come back, all of that's replaced by new imagery and, and it can it drops away. So what's left in the memories and the pain, what's real, but, uh, but it doesn't control in the same way. And it allows people to open out and, and, and be healed. Uh, so you, you still have the scar right? and you still have the pain, but it's not twisted, it's not a twisted pain. And, and that's what reconciliation is. You don't, uh, you don't try and get rid of the pain. You can't get rid of the handicap. You can assuage it. The turmoil is all over the board for um, thousands of veterans over the years. And many have struggled successfully to overcome the problems that uh, were rooted in their experience in Vietnam during the war. And for some, the last step in that process is to come back to Vietnam, and I've witnessed it a number of times, where um, the, uh, the experience might range from mild pleasure. Oh, this is a nice place. I just, I didn't quite imagine it like this. To the other extreme where there's just a, a, a complete catharsis. I mean, just a breakdown where um, guys who were, um, uh, you know, helicopter machine gunners or who were, who were various, uh, had a lot of different roles and terrible situations in the, in the uh, army or the military. Big hulking guys the size of linebackers, you know, will, will uh, break down and weep while a little scrawny Vietnamese veteran is patting him on the back and saying, it's okay, it's okay, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. You did your duty. We understand. We're brothers. It's over. It's finished, you know. And for so many of these guys, it's like they're, it's like 30 years of, of this overwhelming burden that they've carried, uh, all of that is just sort of lifted from the um, encounters they have with Vietnamese veterans here. So all the Vietnamese people, they really, they genuinely share that idea. It's not something that they could make up. I mean, a nation of 80 million people can't get together and decide this is going to be our line. It's just that they, they really, they feel it. 
and they they share that with us and it's um it's a very um it's a humbling experience but it's also it's also inspiring and it's a lesson that's uh, been uh, valuable for me. I mean, it's a lesson that I really will treasure for the rest of my life. I was in Vietnam in 1968 with Third Marines fighting over here. And it occurred to me after I returned to the USA, I knew nothing about Vietnam. So after 25, 26 years, whatever it was, I decided it was time to come back and meet the Vietnamese as a people and not as an enemy. My first day in Saigon, I'm sitting in my hotel room and I thought, it's time, I have got to walk outside. I came here to be here. It's time to walk outside. So I talked myself into walking around the block one time and just see what it felt like to be back on Vietnamese soil. And I did, and I was walking around the block, and it's a true story, this man stopped me, and he says, uh, in broken English, how long you been in Vietnam? I said, today, today. He says, oh, he says, you've been in Vietnam before. And I thought, well, yeah, that's why I'm here. I said, yes, 1968. I said, I was with U.S. Marines. And he pointed his finger at me and said, you're the enemy. And my heart just almost dropped, and I said, yep. I'm the enemy, and he put his arms around me and gave me a big hug, and he said, welcome to Vietnam. And I thought, wow. So from that point on, I as a human being changed, and I was no longer afraid to be here. I had my moments when I went back to where I did combat. I went back to Quang Chi. I had my moments, but that fear was gone from that time. And that's what happens to veterans. You can go back. Uh, you can find healing. Uh, you can find peace again. Uh, I never want to forget I was in Vietnam. I don't want it to dominate who I am as a human being. And by coming back and meeting the people and opening my heart, then it changes me as a human being and it makes my life better. Jones got involved in the work of Friendship Village a residential program in Hanoi that provides care for children designated as victims of Agent Orange. In the words of its late founder, Vietnam veteran George Mizo, Friendship Village was established to cultivate reconciliation and heal the wounds of the Vietnam War. In the same spirit, other veterans have returned to Vietnam to engage in the work of making peace. Chuck Searcy was stationed near Saigon during the war. He now lives in Hanoi, where he coordinates a major project to clean up unexploded ordnance in Quang Chi province. Up until the year 2000, um, VVMF, Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund, um, was focused only on the mission of maintaining the, the memorial itself and sustaining the programs and the activities, commemorations and events uh, surrounding the memorial, but in a delegation visit during that year, 2000, of about 20 or 21 uh, members of the uh, board of directors and the uh, corporate council which supports the memorial fund. Uh, on that visit to Vietnam, the, the veterans in that group decided that they wanted to do something for Vietnam. Um, beyond just the, the, the wall itself. And so out of that came the project in Quang Tri province, which is known as Project Renew, to help clean up the bombs and the mines and the artillery shells and mortar rounds and grenades and all of the uh, other ordnance left after the war. The problem in Vietnam of uh, unexploded ordnance is probably much greater than most Americans would ever imagine. In fact, most people are surprised to find that there still is a problem 35 years after the war ended. Since 1975, at the end of the war, 
through 1998, about 35,000 people have been killed and about 65,000 people injured by unexploded bombs, and mines, accidents uh, during peacetime. So that's more than 100,000, and that's a conservative estimate. It's, uh, we don't know the exact total number, but it would be far higher than that. Um, in Guangxi province, where we work, the accidents continue, although uh, we hope, partly because of the project there, the number of accidents has decreased, the number of children and adults being killed and injured has gone down. So there is some progress. But the only uh, real security in assuring people's safety is to clean up the debris and get it safely destroyed so that a child is not going to step on a cluster bomb or a farmer is not going to hit uh, a bomb with his uh, plow or with his hoe. So uh, we don't know how much is left. The Vietnamese estimate several hundred thousand tons still remaining in the ground and under the ground and on top of the ground. But we are continuing the work, we and other organizations and the Vietnamese army, to clean it up. Uh, and with enough resources, with enough money, and uh, with the right application of skills and expertise, which the Vietnamese have, they know how to do this, and they know how to do it right, and they know how to do it safely. Um, with adequate resources, uh, we could clean up the problem in Vietnam in another decade and say that this country is now safe. But without the resources needed, then it's going to go on for hundreds of years into the future. And we, you know, we don't know when the last casualty may occur from a bomb that was dropped in 1972 or 1973 or 1975, just days before the, the, the peace came to Vietnam. Project Renew also provides vocational training opportunities and financial assistance for the victims of UXO accidents. We um, started the vocational training for 25 blind people who are the victim of landmine. Um, the, the training is uh, running for almost two months and uh, we intend to uh, train them three months so that they can uh, have a job earn money by themselves and help them to reintegrate into the community. by the blind people is really beautiful. Yeah. And uh, they can sell it out for twelve thousand dollars. It's uh, almost uh, one US dollar. Many UXO accidents result from ordinary farming activities, such as plowing fields. But some people risk their lives scavenging for the scrap metal from these bombs, which they can sell for 10 cents a pound. That was the case for this woman's family in Dongha. While she and her son survived the explosion with serious injuries, her husband was killed on the spot. Project Renew now helps her family with a low-interest microloan. Just around uh, 180 US dollars to a uh, raging pig, uh, you know, so that uh, they can, uh, after months, they can uh, sell the pig and take the money and pay for the, the, the loan back after two years or three years. Yeah. Uh, you, I would like to show you the, the pig. Yeah. Because the highest concentrations of bombs are found in the poorest rural areas of the country, 
85% of UXO victims live either at or below the poverty line. Microloans help many of these families rebuild their lives more quickly than they could ever do on their own. Another veteran, Ken Herman, returned to Vietnam 10 years ago. He set up an NGO that provides direct aid to communities in Da Nang and nearby Quang Nam province, the area where he was stationed during the war. The work is carried out by American college students who participate in a service learning program based in upstate New York. Today, the group will deliver a shipment of much needed supplies to the people of Hua Van leper colony outside Da Nang city. My name is Ken. Uh, Ken. How are you? <laughs> the problems uh, often with those who come to help are not that they're not caring, it's that uh, they come from a humanitarian orientation, a charity orientation. Uh, with a certain arrogance that always goes with that. Uh, when I was a kid in, in South Buffalo, uh, my father belonged to a charitable group that every, every Thanksgiving would distribute baskets to people. And then he would return home and feel good about what he did. And it even made me question when I was 10 and 11 and 12 years old whether he was giving them food on Thanksgiving to meet their needs or to make himself feel good. And, and I think that's, that's part of the difficulty in involving people in the kind of work that we do in direct aid um, and part of the difficulty in generating support for what we do. Uh, we don't build hospitals and we don't build schools and we don't build buildings on which people can place their names. We build lives. <laughs> The colony was established in 1960 and today is home to about 300 lepers and their immediate family members. Herman's group makes periodic deliveries here of essential items such as cooking oil and noodles as well as medicines for the clinic. In this community, students discover that direct aid means directly confronting the reality of human suffering and the alarming inequities in the world that deprive some people of even the most basic forms of medical care. If I'm a humanitarian, then I give people charity. And I expect something in return, at least feelings of goodwill and a tax deduction. If I'm a humanist, then it's a question of being able to, uh, uh, to move into the lives of other people, to feel the honor of being able to experience not only their smiles, but their pain. The important word, I think, the operational term for those who want to do this kind of work is empathy. Um, not caring, uh, not understanding, but empathy. Do they have the ability or are they willing to develop the skill of moving inside the skin of other people? 
to feel what the Vietnamese feel, to smell what they smell, to taste what they, they taste, um, to think the way they think. If they're able and willing to do that, then indeed they can affect change. Uh, a failure to do that um, prohibits anybody from affecting change. In 2001, we were asked by a woman at the Da Nang Red Cross if we would begin to provide uh, services to those who were victims of America's use of dioxin during the war. America sprayed and dumped 20 million gallons of the deadliest chemical known to mankind on this country during the war. Uh, the Vietnamese estimate three to four million victims are still in this country, a large percentage of them children. So off I went with this worker uh, from Da Nang Red Cross on the back of her motorbike into the rural hamlets and into the mountain and met people. Um, and while I knew it was a problem, because I'm a Vietnam veteran, and there are all kinds of Americans who are Vietnam veterans who suffer as a result of Agent Orange, and their children too. Um, but it was, it was peculiar, it struck me as odd that the U.S. government didn't recognize that there were victims in Vietnam of the same problems with the same source that they were compensating in America. Number one. A major focus of Herman's work is providing direct assistance to families with sick and disabled children. Many of the children he supports suffer from conditions that are linked to Agent Orange. Oh, you're going to go to sleep? A little boy uh, fought two-year-old boy uh, dealing with hydrocephalus and hyperthyroidism and uh, a variety of other physical disorders including a serious case of pneumonia that we took to the hospital in Da Nang just the other day is teetering on the brink of death at this point as of this morning. No one knows. <coughs> This baby's sick. He's got a fever. He's not breathing. He should go today. Can they get him there today or should we help him get him there? Let's go to the hospital. Off to the hospital. Go to the hospital. You have a fever, baby. If people get involved in helping people like Little Fat to make themselves feel good, uh, they probably will not get involved at all. It's not a question of humanitarianism, it's a question of humanism. Is one philosophically oriented to the point where that person understands they have no option? that we live for the purpose of helping fat. We have a responsibility not just for folks down the street, but for the world community. And if we think we don't have that responsibility, I think we don't understand where our clothes are made and where our food is processed and who makes our cars nowadays. It's one world and it's quite simple. At least it is to me.